Good afternoon and thank you for joining us this afternoon. What a wonderful introduction to this exhibition. Today I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of this land on which we are gathered here today. I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people who are present here today. Welcome to this exhibition celebrating the landmark counterculture magazine Oz, which can now be viewed in its entirety through research online, the University of Wollongong's open access digital repository. In particular, we would wish to welcome our special guest, co-founding editor Richard Walsh, um, Louise Ferrier, who worked on London Oz, and Jim Anderson, co-editor of London Oz. We have Ros Sharp and Sandy Sharp, um, executor of Martin Sharp's estate, who sadly passed away in December 2013. George Gittos and Jean Lewis from the Yellow House Artist Collective, um, which was based in Sydney during the 1970s. We have Gary Shedd, the original artist of Sydney Oz and a renowned artist in his own right. And Jane Err, a veteran documentary filmmaker who's currently working on a project focusing on Richard Neville. In 2013, Michael Organ, the Library Manager of Repository Services, suggested digitising Oz Magazine as part of the library's digitisation program, largely because of its significance as part of Australia's history. Library staff then approached founding co-editor Richard Neville and secured the rights to digitise a complete publication series of both Sydney and then London Oz as of March 2015 these were then made available on open access for researchers, for students, academics, and the wider community. The library is developing a significant collection relating to the history of counterculture in Australia. And these digitised historic publications from the 60s and early 70s include The Arty Wild Goat, The Living Daylights, and The Yellow House Collection. And as an aside, we do have a virtual reality experience for those of you who are interested of one of the rooms of Yellow House today. This exhibition has been put together by, like, by the staff of the library to feature material from both Oz, Sydney and London, related publications, the marvellous art of Martin Shah. We also here have here today Richard Walsh. Richard is an Australian writer, publisher and supporter of the arts. He's had an illustrious career in publishing and was acknowledged for this in 2008 when he received the Magazine Publishers Association's Lifetime Achievement Award for his outstanding contribution to the magazine industry. He edited Oz, Poll, National Review in his early career and he was then later publisher of such iconic magazines such as the Australian Women's Weekly, The Bulletin and Clio. Richard is a graduate in Medicine and Arts from the University of Sydney. His career highlights include Assistant Director of the Australian Institute of Industrial Psychology, Creative Group Head at J. Walter Thompson, where his art director was Ken Doan, Managing Director of Angus and Robertson Publishers from 1972 to 1986, and Head of the Australian Consolidated Press from 1986 to 1998. Richard was a founding member of the Literature Board of the Australian Council. He has served on boards of many other prominent organisations, including the National Advisory Council of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the New South Wales State Library, the Sydney Theatre Company, and the Cultural Committee of the Sydney Organising Committee for the Olympic Games. He has been chairman for the following UNESCO Australia, Quest for Life Foundation, the Nimrod Theatre, and the New South, Ministry, New South Wales Ministerial Advisory Council on Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drugs. And he's co-chairman of the New South Wales Obesity Summit in 2002. In addition to all of this, he's been the author of eight books and has written for both the theatre and television. Today, he is consultant publisher Alan Munwin, for whom he commissions around 20 new books a year. He lectures part-time in the book publishing course at Sydney's McClay College and appears regularly on Richard Glover's Drive program on ABC Radio. Thank you. I enjoyed that program. <laughs> um, he represents a number of writers in their dealings with the film and TV industry. 
And we're just so delighted that he could eke out a small part of his time to be here with us today. <laughs> so as co-founding editor of Oz Magazine Sydney, we are pleased to welcome you, Richard, here today to launch our latest library exhibition, Satire to Sex, Oz Magazine, 1963 to 1973. Please welcome Richard. Much. I want to say from the outset, of course, this exhibition is partly to do with uh, Australian Oz, Sydney Oz, and partly to do with London Oz. I want to take the opportunity today to talk about Australian Oz, because that's the magazine that I edited, co edited from start to finish, and I will hope to tell you a little about that journey, where it began, and its uh, slow end, um, and at least to others to tell the story of, of London Oz an even deeper and more complicated story than Australian Oz. The story of Oz began in the offices of Bonnie Soir, the weekly newspaper at Sydney University, where I enrolled in an arts law degree in 1959. The awning I joined in my first year was dominated by two literary geniuses who were simply called Clive and Chester. <laughs> Clive was Clive James, who was to become world famous, of course. But in those days, Clive wrote all his material in collaboration with Chester, whose real name was a heavily guarded secret, but was, in fact, Philip Graham. Among those who joined Oni that year were my best friend, Peter Gross, and also Mungo McCallum and Bob Ellis. There was also a group of very sharp-witted fresh ends, as they were called, including the future acclaimed novelist, Madeline St. John. There were many other talented writers besides Clive and Chester, and some marvellous cartoonists, including Robert Hughes, the great art critic. They were producing an honissoire that was notable for its wit and particularly for its literary parodies. Once a year, on Commem Day, which celebrated the founding of our university, we produced a special issue of honissoire that was sold downtown in support of charity. It always took the form of, some, of a spoof of some well-known magazine, for example, Time or the Australian Women's Weekly. The Oni team also wrote sketches for the Sydney University Review, which was so good that it attracted strong support from downtown audiences. As newcomers to this talented pool of writers, we youngsters were expected to be spear carriers rather than lead actors. On the newspaper, we subbed their copy and occasionally managed to get a little of our own writing printed. In the theatre, we built the sets. For a couple of years, Leo Schofield was the, uh, was the director of the Sydney University Review, and I worked as his stage manager. The editors of Onisoir were chosen each year by the SRC, the Students' Representative Council, who were its publishers. But the kind of newspaper that was enjoyed by the arts and law students was traditionally bitterly opposed by the engineering and medicine students, <laughs> who wanted plenty of sports news and none of that arty farty stuff. <laughs> In my second year of arts, the engineers held sway on the SRC, and they chose an editor pledged to purge all of Oni's literary pretensions. The situation quickly became chaotic. Some of Oni's former alumni, including Clive, had now graduated. Some simply resigned. It became a shadow of its former glory. But I and my friends were determined to stick with it, and I became its news editor. No one seemed to mind that the news reports were at times fairly acerbic. In 1962, Peter Gross and I became co-editors of Onisoir. We were determined to produce something distinctive, but we ultimately fell foul of the SRC, who sacked us for a report I had written on one of, about one of their meetings, which they felt was disrespectful. As a result, there was a great fruit furore and many former Onisoir editors came out publicly in support of us, most notably Donald Horne, who was by then the influential editor of the Bulletin. Peter and I were ultimately reinstated as editors. But in the middle of all this kerfuffle, we attended a national students' newspaper editors' conference in Adelaide. Richard Neville, who was then the editor of Thurunka at the University of New South Wales, had organised to be driven to Adelaide by his great mate Alex Popoff, who was later a well-known architect and for time was in fact the son-in-law of Jörn Utzon. Richard invited us to join them on their extended road trip. We did, and the rest is history. 
Peter and I were sick of the restraints the SRC was imposing on us. The way in which the downtown public supported our university reviews and the annual Commemda issues of Onisoir. They emboldened us to believe that if we could produce a monthly satirical magazine ourselves, it would pay for itself. Richard, Richard Neville, was enthusiastic. He believed he had friends who could stump up the money and he was willing to throw himself into the venture as he was about to graduate and was at a loose end. Richard has told the story of the beginnings of Oz in his book, Heavy Heavy Shake. Essentially, we convened a meeting at his house on the first Sunday of 1963. We brought to the meeting many of his, he brought to the meeting many of his Thurunka mates. But also more importantly, I've got here Martin Sharp and Gary Shepherd. Gary tells me he wasn't at this famous meeting, but that's what I thought. <laughs> uh, who were the co-editors of the Art of Wild Oak, the student paper at East Sydney Tech, which was the forerunner, of course, of the National Art School. I brought my own mates, including Peter Gross and Dean Lecture, of whom more anon. In an, in, an, in an unpublished interview with Lau Tarling, Martin Sharp remembered that afternoon this way. Richard Neville, this is a quote, Richard Neville and Richard, uh, sorry, Richard Walsh and Richard Neville called a meeting. Every year there'd be a special issue of the uni students' newspapers on Commem Day or Foundation Day, which was students' prank day. There were parades through the city, floats and things like that. I'd worked, this is Martin, I'd worked on a few pastiches of Sunday comics for Ronnie Soir, making political jokes. Michael Glasheen and Peter Kingston, who's here today, were cartooning for Thurunka. Everyone was excited by the idea of combining the papers and releasing a regular university student paper on the streets. That night, Oz was born. Richard Walsh suggested the name, which I thought was silly at the time. <laughs> Lau asked Martin what name he would have preferred, to which he replied, ASP, ASP, for Australia's satirical paper. But Oz was perfect, of course, this is Martin. But Oz was perfect, of course. Australia, the Wizard of Oz. It's a paradoxical name. Humorous, good natured. It's got a lot of angles to it. It was just right. And so, there it was. Oz. End of quote. Weirdly, only two people at that first meeting had turned their minds to what this new magazine might be called Martin and me. Even more weirdly, the name Martin proposed was probably the worst idea I ever heard him come up with. <laughs> it, was, it was, of course, as you can see, an enormously talented and creative guy. But anyhow, everyone agreed that we would call it Oz. Richard Neville, Martin Sharp and myself had superficially similar backgrounds. Each of us had come from a Sydney non-GPS private school where we had been considered oddballs. But we brought to Oz totally different talents. Mark was a creative genius. Without his wonderful cartoons, I doubt we would have made much impact. I ran the editorial side of the magazine, choosing what contributions we published and subbing them. Richard and I wrote stuff, of course, both individually and collaboratively. Richard, Richard Neville was a charismatic charmer who was able to raise the money we needed and create the buzz that was essential for us to overcome the distribution hurdles that confronted us. At the time, the suburban news agents in each state were firmly under the thumb of the press barons, who urged them not to offer our magazine for sale. But the situation in the city, in the city itself, was quite different. In those days, newspapers were sold on street corners by so-called newspaper boys. Most of them, in fact, grown men, and an extremely bolshevik, and they refused to be dictated to by the newspaper bosses. We sold the very first issue ourselves, using an army of attractive female students who Richard had personally recruited. <laughs> he was very good at that. And after that, it was sold by the city's newsboys and a few maverick news agents who refused to be cowed by Fairfax, Murdoch and Packer. <laughs> Our first issue appeared on April Fool's Day, 1963, and was immediately prosecuted for obscenity. Our legal advice was to cop it sweet, and we received a small fine for our efforts. But then Richard, Martin, and myself, together with our printer, were again charged with obscenity for issue number six, <laughs> which was published in February 1964. And we were sentenced to six months hard labour by a crazy magistrate called Jerry Locke. All hell broke loose at such an, at such an outrageous decision. Overnight, we had become the notorious Osboys, and the case became 
uh, calls celeb. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had two great pieces of luck. First, if Magistrate Locke had sentenced us to a week in jail, I'm not sure there would be much fuss. But six months hard labour was an extraordinary overreaction and gained for a sympathy from all but the most die-hard Conservatives. After all, we had been prosecuted by the notorious New South Wales Vice Squad and most citizens were vaguely aware that many of its members were on the take from prostitution, illegal gambling and sly grog. We were clearly being silenced by the powers that be. The second piece of great good fortune was that this particular issue of Oz was perhaps the best we ever produced. Martin was at the top of his form and contributed some wonderful cartoons, one of which, called the word flashed round the arms, became instantaneously famous. The copy on the front cover, cover which I had written, somehow got right up the magistrate's nose. There was a terrific piece by Bob Ellis and a letter to the editor by David Dale, who was at that time a schoolboy from Coogee, who was deluging us, deluging us with copy. One sentence that was not intended to be humorous still makes me laugh. It read, quotes, It is difficult to contact Oz editors and staff because they are either earning a living elsewhere, on the dole, or doing exams. Those with complaints can ring JZ3650, preferably in the evening, end quotes. That was my phone number, and I was still living with my parents. This was not exactly a highly professional, exactly high professional porn ring. <laughs> Rich and I subsequently travelled all over the country, talking to mass protest meetings and raising money for our legal defence. Around this time, I had become involved with a new weekly satirical program called The Mavis Bramston Show which had just started on the Seven Network. For some years, I wrote its opening sketch called The Oz Newsroom, a satirical look at the news of the day. You can read more about the, the groundbreaking Mavis Bramston show on Wikipedia and about the fabulous benefit concert they staged in our honor on the 15th of November, 1964. I will say nothing more about the Titanic struggle in the law courts as Richard's memoir provides details. And in fact, there's currently an attempt being made to dramatise it for Australian television. However, after a long, long battle, all the charges against us were thrown out. The good news was that a huge weight had been lifted from our shoulders. The bad and sad news was that there was nothing now to hold Richard and Martin back from their long-nourished dream of leaving Sydney and travelling the world. So issue number 25, dated January 1966, was the last issue that Richard and I co-edited together, and I think the last to which he actually contributed. Henceforth, the magazine was co-edited by Dean Lecture and myself, but unfortunately, Martin continued to send us artwork from wherever he was in the world. He and Richard had first headed north into Asia, but Asia food, Asian food did not agree with Mark, and he soon decided to head to London on his own, with Richard to follow at his own pace. Dean and I had great fun and many adventures. Issue number 28 created an enormous storm. Its front cover asked, why did Goff go off like that? But in those far off days, Goff was not Goff Whitlam, but Archbishop Goff, the Anglican Prime of Australia, who had snuck out of the country under utterly scandalous circumstances. <laughs> we were in the process of printing issue number 35 in, uh, in December 1967, when the Prime Minister, Harold Holt, that drowned. We deemed it inappropriate uh, we, sorry, we deemed it appropriate to black out the cover we had intended <coughs> for that issue, and it appeared as you see it. I think I own the only copy of that issue that escaped this act of self-censorship, and I share that with you today. This is what we would have gone and sailed with before, <laughs> before Harold had swung to China. <laughs> In some ways, Oz pioneered the same trajectory, trajectory as was later blazed by the chaser. As many of you will know, The Chase began its life in 1999 as a satirical newspaper founded by a group of ex-Sydney University students who had previously edited on Issoir and produced university reviews. With my involvement in Mavis Bramston, Oz had by late 1964, in the modern parlance, brand extended into television. Through my collaboration with Jim Sharman, we also brand extended into theatre. Jim, who was later to gain great fame in both Australia and London for the creation of the Rocky Horror Show and many other acclaimed productions, asked our permission to adapt material we had published in Oz 
from which he created a review called On Stage Oz. That was so successful that Jim and I launched the group theatre, and one of its productions was another review called Terra Australis, T-R-R-O-R, Terra Australis, <laughs> mainly created by Dean Letcher, but to which I and others contributed. It was staged in March 1968 and starred two bright young actors called Gary MacDonald and Helen Morse. It was panned by the Sydney Morning Herald's stuffy theatre critic, but Patrick, but Patrick White was moved to write a letter to the newspaper in our support, which created quite a stir. As part of our brand, brand extension, I was also producing for Sun Books annual anthologies which combined the best newspaper cartoons of the year with a whimsical text that I provided. In 1966, they published No Holds Barred. In 1967, <laughs> Goff Syrup. And in 1968, Gordon the Act. <laughs> I also signed an agreement with Sun Books to compile an anthology of great Australian satire, but somehow I never found time to honour that commitment. At the end of 1967, I had graduated in medicine, but instead of starting my junior residency, I decided to take time off. To this day, I'm still on leave from medicine. <laughs> I became a copywriter, as you've heard, of J. Walter Thompson, and then started Poll, which was aimed at a new generation of educated and discerning women. When I returned to J. Walter Thompson, I became creative group head with Ken Doan as my art director. I was mainly writing TV commercials and producing them, and sometimes directing them. Shameful to admit today, I wrote a series of famous Benson Hedges ads for Stuart Wagstaff. Even more shamefully, when I resigned from the agency in order to edit what became the weekly newspaper, Nation Review, my place was taken by Llewellyn Thomas, the son of Dylan Thomas. And when Llewellyn ultimately resigned the account, her place was taken by Richard Neville's sister, Jill Neville, who was a well-regarded novelist. In, do in those far-off days, there were very few ways in which a writer could earn a living apart from being a copywriter. In amongst all that, Dean and I kept producing odds on an irregular basis. The last issue in, in magazine format was number 40, and it was dated February 1969. Martin happened to be temporarily in Australia at that time, so he was able to contribute a little, more, <coughs> a little more to it than usual. After that, Dean and I began on 1st of April 1969, producing an edgy political newsletter, which we always referred to as Oz Newsletter. It came out every fortnight, and apart from our own writings, Mungo McCallum was our main outside contributor. At the time, Mungo was employed as the parliamentary diarist for the Australian newspaper. It was obviously not known that he was our uh, Canberra correspondent as well. <laughs> Issue 56 of the newsletter looked a little like the old magazine, and was an election special dated the 25th of October 1969. But by, by the 23rd of November 1970, Dean and I had run out of puff, and on that date, we produced our last newsletter. We numbered it circa 82, <laughs> because we had at times been careless in our numbering, and we were unsure how many we named. <laughs> <laughs> Very informal. Meanwhile, half a world away, Richard Neville and a new cohort of pals, including Jim Anderson, who's here today, had launched London Oz in February 1967. Their first issue, contained the following information, quotes, London Oz derives from Oz, a monthly satirical magazine founded in Australia in 1963 by Richard Neville and Richard Walsh. Oz Australia is still thriving with a circulation of approximately 40,000 and for one pound sent to Oz, 16 Hunter Street, Sydney, with your name and address, will guarantee a whole year's supply of this delightful, cheeky oddity, <laughs> end quotes. <laughs> but London Oz is a different story and one I'm not equipped to tell. However, the coexistence of these two magazines has never failed to confuse even close observers. Apart from the fact that the original Oz and London Oz obviously share a name and share the inputs of Richard and Martin, there is the extraordinary coincidence that London Oz too was prosecuted for obscenity and three editors were jailed and ultimately after a great hullabaloo they were exonerated. Internationally, London Oz is much better known than the Australian satirical magazine. But apart from that, they were very different magazines and have contributed to two very different publishing traditions. I guess they reflect the very different personalities of Richard Neville and myself. My own interest is in social and political satire. I've never belonged to a political party, but I have a lifelong interest in the political process. I have this afternoon attempted to provide you with the context in which Oz was created and how its spirit reached out 
into other fields of activity. And for me personally, <coughs> for me personally that spirit continued long after Oz was dead. I went on to create the weekly newspaper, Nation Review of the 70s, to which I again recruited Bob Ellis and Mungo McCallum, amongst others. Much later, in 2000, I began the Zeitgeist Gazette, an internet newsletter, in which I collaborated with my old friend David Solter, who had been the first executive producer of ABC TV's Media Watch. This month, in my current position at Alan Nunn, I published a very funny book by Andrew Street, actually reviewed this morning's Australia, called The Short and Excruciatingly Embarrassing Reign of Captain Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> he might accuse me of having a morbid addiction to satire. <laughs> Richard Neville and, Richard and Martin Sharp, on the other hand, always found pol politics ho hum. At one time, when Bruce Petty was the political cartoonist of the Australian newspaper, Martin was asked to fill in while Bruce took a holiday. He struggled with that, and I helped him as best I could. For Rich and Mart, the two best known slogans from the late 60s make love, not war, and turn on, tune in, drop out, never lost their relevance. All three of us were utopians, I guess. But whereas I believed and still believe that society needs to be organized in order to deliver material and spiritual nourishment, Richard and Mark believed that good vibes alone, supplemented by recreational drugs, could deliver Nirvana. <laughs> London Oz was an inspired vehicle for their sincerely held beliefs. It was an underground magazine and closely related to other countercultural publications then being produced in London and the USA. It stands up extremely well in comparison. The original Sydney Oz was inspired by the world of Private Eye and the BBC's weekly satirical TV show, That Was the Week That Was. Oz's humour was topical and therefore ephemeral. Much of it does not mean anything to a modern readership. But as you look at this exhibition and puzzle over it, do not judge us too harshly. As they say, you had to be there. And yet the path that led to Norman Gunston, to Max Gillies, to Fast Forward, to the Wharf Reviews, to Sean McAuliffe, and the Chaser programs had to start somewhere. We were simply laying the first papers of the Yellow Brick Road. Thank you. I think we all owe our eternal thanks for, for Richard and Martin um, for chronicling a period of time that otherwise would have gone underground in some ways, not in the way that the counterculture um, um, movement wanted it to go. So our ex sincere thank you to Richard Walsh, special guests. Um, to Richard and Julie Neville, Roger Bowley, and also to the library exhibitions team who pulled this event together. And I must say thank you very much to them. <laughs> this event, or this exhibition, is not a standalone exhibition. We do have special topic presentations um, timetable for you. So at 12.30 on Friday, November 20, The Politics of Oz with Dr Anthony Ashbolt will provide a look into the political context which gave rise to the development of this landmark counterculture magazine. And then on December 4th at 12.30, The Art of Oz with Oz London co-editor Jim Anderson, who will be here to discuss the graphic art of Oz um, from its Australian satirical origins through to the UK-based psychedelic and political editions. And of course, this exhibition is made available online through research online. So you can visit it wherever you may be at any time. So thank you for joining us today. Um, stay a little longer, linger, have a look at this wonderful collection, have some amazing conversations, partake into the refreshments, and um, enjoy your afternoon. And thank you very much for being here at the University of Melbourne Online. Somewhere along the line, it may seem strange that Richard isn't here. It is. And, and I should just say that unfortunately he's not well, he, he's, uh, he, he's incapacitated, and, and that was a very sad thing. But I, I, it does seem strange he's not here and not talking about it. He can talk about both magazines, or, but not today, so I'm not apologising, but I'm just simply saying that in case you're wondering.